All right. Uh, thanks, CJ. Then, for the second half of this session, it is my pleasure to introduce Christopher Putin. Christopher is a political scientist working in the strongly interdisciplinary field of technology assessment at the Institute of Technology Assessment and Systems Analysis within the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. At Git, he heads the research group Life, Innovation, Health and Technology and also conducts research on the history of transhumanist thought and its significance in the Anthropocene. He is editor of the journal Nanoethics, Studies on New and Emerging Technologies. Christopher, welcome. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. So um, maybe I should say I'm not a transhumanist activist or something. In fact, I'm, I was often invited, in particular in Germany, as a critic of transhumanism. But what I'm doing for quite a while, or basically since the beginning, that I'm thinking about is defending transhumanism as a serious philosophy, um, which is very important to understand our relationship to technology and, and also concerning the future of humanity. What I'm trying to do is uh, today is um, I'm trying to, um, because this is what I'm working on a lot, is to, uh, a little bit of the history of transhumanism. Um, I don't know how much you know about it. I know some people know really a lot. Can we turn up the volume? The volumes? <laughs> Better like this? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, I wanted to say a little bit about uh, the history of transhumanism. Some of them know them better than me in the room, but perhaps for some it's interesting, and then I want to basically ask a question uh, about the situation uh, today. Um, thank you. Okay, sorry, this was <laughs> too fast. Okay, um, I don't want to read this and like, all this stuff, like if you want, uh, uh, want to have the slides, I will be happy to share them. So what I basically say, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> you stole my coffee. Okay, so I don't go through all of this, but um, like the background in the 19th century and early 20th century, I think one thing is really important also for us today, because I would say that transhumanism basically was also a response to a disaster, the World War, World War I, the Great War. And uh, uh, philosopher Walter Benjamin uh, was so shocked about this, and many people back then, um, and he argued because the lust for profit of the ruling class sought satisfaction through it, technology betrayed man and tried to bridle a bat into a blood. So the idea with technology we can really, like in the 19th century optimism, we can conquer the world, the universe, we have all kind of progress in all aspects, but in fact it turned out to be just a massacre. It was used for atavistic reasons. And this is something um, where I would like to uh, point out that transhumanism developed in such a context and I would unfortunately say we are in a similar situation today and so one of my questions is how to do this, what kind of futures do we have as humanity and what futures of transhumanism in such a situation. I just go quickly back to what I see and I think Anders also pointed this out long ago, already in the 1990s I think, there is um, one, one person that I would see as an early transhumanist, Winwood Reed, and already from the picture you can see what time this was, like um, white man uh, uh, served by, uh, by black people. He was a very fascinating atheist and, and free thinker, uh, corresponding with Darwin, and basically, and too fast with this. If you compare what he wrote back then, and then for example with um, one um, a passage of the first version of the Transhumanist Declaration, you can see that in a more religious, less technological, less scientific language, he basically uh, had the same ideas that uh, now modern transhumanism has. Like uh, He calls it the invention of immortality, exploration of the infinite, Congress of creation, extinction of disease and sin, so moral enhancement, etc. So we have a kind of around 1870, we already, I would say, we have the core of transhumanist ideas already present. And, uh, but if you look at this stuff of, of him, he influenced quite a large group of people, very different people like Cecil Rhodes, H.G. Uh, Wells, George Orwell, Colin Doyle. 
what we can see is he always has this idea before, so to say, the bright future starts. We have to overcome such things like famine, war, slavery, inequality of conditions, etc. Even him, who was not a socialist or leftist, but a pretty normal, progressively thinking British imperialist, so to say. Um, next, he very much influenced H.G. Uh, Wells, and I guess most of you uh, know him as a as a proto science fiction or scientific romance author. But in fact, he was kind of a world intellectual in his time, so everyone knew him in the world. And he was also the symbol of the, of the future, as George Orwell said. Everyone young around 1900 thought he is, he is the future, so to say. And he, he interviewed Lenin and Stalin and Roosevelt or something. And he's really important. And when I started to work on these topics in the context of my work at my university, it was interesting to see that in documents like about nanotechnology, etc., they would quote him, in particular with something like this about the future, what comes after man, etc. So he he was already kind of socialist, but uh, uh, it become became even clearer. Oh, sorry. Um, and here's this is something. It's a long. I know it's a long quote. Um, what I found interesting is Orwell writes about this about him that he, in every way, was a man of science, working towards a planned world state. And this is opposed to reactionaries who are trying to restore a disorderly past. On the one side, science, order, progress, internationalism, aeroplanes, steel, concrete, hygiene. On the other side, war, nationalism, religion, monarchy, peasants, Greek professors, poets, horses. <laughs> History sees as a series of victories won by the scientific man over the romantic man. And I think this uh, kind of enthusiasm for rationality, for overcoming of traditional culture, religion, nationalism, imperialism, is something that also inspired a number of very important natural scientists, like Holding. Here you see him as a scientist. Later he was in India, and here giving a communist speech or something. And if you read this stuff, you see it's very much like what you can also find in Kurzweil, etc. And for me, the key figure always is here uh, Burnell, with his uh, wonderful text, The World, the Flesh and the Devil, in 1929, because he, techno he brings technology strongly into these transhumanist visions. He was also a communist, like um, I haven't taken pictures of him here where he's meeting Mao and <laughs> Khrushchev, etc. But it's this idea that in order to overcome, in order to develop this, uh, he does not call it transhumanist, but this transhumanist future, first we must overcome class society, we need a world state, um, a capitalism that must be gone, nations must be gone, etc. It's all about science and universalism. And uh, Haldane and Burnell both, of course, did this against the background of this disaster that was described quite poetically by Benjamin, this First World War, where all these new means that humanity has were used for really terrible stuff, atavistic purposes. So, if I sum it up, and this is, I will keep it a little bit longer here, um, I would say transhumanism as a collectivist project, and this might be quite confusing if we talk about this today, and I was quite happy that the speakers in this morning both raised uh, some, so to say, political questions. So transhumanism, to a large extent, I would say started as a collectivist project. So it's also interesting to see that people like Her Haldane and Burnell they, they really treated, for example, their bodies very badly. So, so they, they did not want to become personally immortal. They did not eat all kinds of stuff to keep, to be healthy. They even went down very risky stuff like to improve the working conditions of mine, mining workers. They made self ex experiments, even almost killing themselves, etc. And so it started as a collectivist project aimed at building an empire to end all empires. So all this traditional, traditional stuff has to go, but a kind of post-human or human and later post-human empire over nature. And in the beginning there was some kind of imperial strength in it, but I think a, a clear step in transhumanism from these communists on, from Brunel on, is that uh, they overcome this imperialist bias and they become internationalist, anti-racist, so they did all this kind of uh, important work in this um, in context. And what they do, and this is maybe, I don't know if you know this term from, uh, from say, gender studies and other fields and post-colonial studies, they, 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 they did an othering, 
but not an othering of non-white people, etc. But they did an othering of the non-scientific mind. And with this, they main, mainly meant not uh, people who were not yet educated, but they meant the uh, traditional elites, those ruling the UK, the empire, to, uh, reading Greek, being proud of having no clue of science, etc. So they created a universalistic, universalistic vision of a post-Western kind of total empire, but an empire which is not ruling over men or humans, but humans merging with machines and thereby ruling over nature. So we can problematize this as well, this empire over nature, but it's clear that it's a, a step forward where against an atavistic world organized like in the like 100, 200 years ago, or basically like always, like nations, um, property of land, states, borders, war, uh, they wanted to overcome this. And this is, uh, I would really like to uh, suggest, uh, if you don't know it, uh, watch the movie Things to Come. So this is basically styled after Burnell, and it's after a, a catastrophe, and in London rules, brilliantly played by a Shakespeare um, actor, a kind of Mussolini, with horses and everything. Uh, but in Iraq, uh, they have a new world state, and in a new world state, then they come, and it's a, it's a very good movie, and I think it, uh, it was directly uh, based on something by Wells, and directly uh, uh, Wells was an advisor for it. Um, and now I come to the last point. I don't know if I'm too fast. <laughs> uh, so what I would like to ask more is a question. What are we doing today? So uh, you know this picture, I guess. So it re reminds me as someone very interested in history and also in a history of antiquity, like soldiers or national guards um, camping in the Congress. <laughs> it looks for me like like Rome and I don't know when. So soldiers in the in the in the power of uh, uh, of in the center of the civilization, just like here. So so U.S. Just an example here. This is not World War One, but it looks like World War One. That's of course Ukraine. And uh, here, okay, we don't need to talk about now about this conflict. But we are not Netanyahu. We are not Hamas. Bam, bam, bam. Religion, land, nation, flags, all this stuff that uh, these people so uh, abhorred, in my point of view, these early transhumanists or proto-transhumanists. This is a forbidden picture, of course, in Russian. Uh, social media, and here's something that I don't know to what extent it is already known in the transhumanist community, but there is a, in, in Russia, among ideologues, mainly from the church, the Russian state church, there is a new, um, and they, they publish books and they feed into these uh, um, right-wing or other conspiracy thinking uh, social media. Basically, they argue there's a conspiracy of the West against uh, um, Russian and all traditional culture, and it's a trans trans. So it's trans people, trans humanism. And so these are all examples, and we could add many more, where I wonder what would transhumanists, uh, what could a transhumanist future that I much like, I'm a child of a sp space age, and I like many of these visions, how can this look like in a world where we have, in my point of view, a step back, in particular in the last 10 years or so, or basically since 9-11, a step back into really atavistic times. I, I give us one last example of this. When I was a teenager, I would have never expected that uh, religious fanatism, fanaticism, um, um, all this kind of nationalism would come back. And I'm really unsure how to deal with this. I did um, intentionally not talk about the internal discussions in transhumanism about politics. I know about this discussion, libertarianism, liberalism, social democracy. So this is not my, my role. I just wondered how would transhumanists in these days uh, position themselves towards this stuff. And one thing I think here is important. Um, I f fully understand, as has been said in the morning, that if you have allies within rich, important, super important people, I think this is really important to take into account. At the same time, I'm really shocked how um, this culture of the early 2000s, IT, California stuff, has turned in the meantime often in a kind of, yeah, they are, they are in an alliance with fascists. And what Elon Musk, for example, was mentioned as someone who should not be 
so to say, identified with transhumanism, but I fully agree. What he is doing, basically, in their for forging coalitions with people who are against reason, against a shared humanity, a common future of humanity. And therefore, just as a question, what, uh, how can transhumanism deal with this new atavism, if you agree with my analysis? Thank you very much.